you've probably heard of graphene. The reason there's so much interest in this material is because it promises to revolutionize electronics, sensors, computing, energy storage, and all kinds of structural engineering. The reason is its physical properties are simply off the charts. Graphene has 10 times the thermal conductivity of copper, twice that of diamond. It's higher than any other known material. It conducts electricity better than any metal, better than silver. And its coefficient of friction is three times lower than Teflon. Mechanically, it simply pegs the meter. Graphene is 200 times stronger than steel, at one-fifth the weight. To put that in perspective, aluminum has three times the strength to weight ratio of steel. That's why they build airplanes out of it. Graphite, or carbon fiber, has 15 times the strength to weight ratio. Graphene, 1,000 times. In addition, it's extremely tough. Toughness is the measure of how much work you have to do to break something. Force times distance. Something can be very strong, like glass or carbon fiber, but because you can only stretch it a fraction of 1% before it breaks, you have to apply a fair amount of force, but for a very short distance. You can break it with a hammer. Graphene can stretch up to 5% of its original length before it ruptures, so you have to use an enormous amount of force for a very long distance. It's not indestructible, but it's getting pretty close. And you can imagine what this would do for architectural engineering, safety equipment, sporting equipment, aerospace, space elevators, the list goes on. The reason it has the properties it does is well understood. Graphene is pure carbon, arranged in a two-dimensional molecule, one atom thick, and indeterminate in the x and y direction. It's a sheet. Each of the individual carbon atoms is bonded to three neighboring carbons with an extremely strong carbon-to-carbon -carbon covalent bond. It's one of the strongest in nature. The result is this hexagonal or honeycomb type of arrangement. The reason it has such high thermal conductivity is the transport of thermal energy through a material, is the propagation of thermal vibrations through that material. Because graphene is so stiff, the speed of sound is so high, that propagation is very rapid as it moves across a sheet of graphene. The reason it has such high electrical conductivity is because of the 2D nature of its molecule. The electromagnetic field across the surface is homogeneous, so current can flow across like water with very little obstruction. The reason it's so strong is because of the extremely strong carbon-to-carbon -carbon bonds. And the reason it's so tough is because of the macroscopic structure of this hexagonal arrangement. You can stretch and compress this substantially without changing the angles of the bond very much. Now this is just carbon, and carbon is everywhere. I'm 20% carbon, this room is filled with carbon, we breathe carbon, it's widely available, and it's cheap. So why don't we see this already all over industry? The simple answer is, it's pretty hard to come by. And it's particularly frustrating because we are surrounded by it. This pencil contains a substantial amount of graphene. This rod that we use to fabricate our rocket nozzles is mostly graphene, because graphite is mostly graphene. When you take individual sheets of graphene and you line them up so that the atom of one layer lines up with the center of the hexagons of the neighboring layer, they get as close together as they can. This is the stable bond that occurs in graphite. However, unlike the tremendously strong bonds between the carbons in the graphene sheets, the bonds between these individual sheets is very, very weak. So thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity between the sheets, not so good. And because these sheets can peel apart like playing cards, graphite doesn't express the same mechanical properties of graphene. But we're kind of in a catch-22, because even though these sheets are relatively weakly bonded, it's still strong enough that it's hard for us to get it apart. But it can be done. 
Early on, when researchers were studying graphene, they came up with a really clever method to peel away the individual sheets of graphene from a piece of graphite. If you take adhesive tape, scotch tape, and you apply it to the surface of a piece of graphite like this, just schmutz it down and peel it up. And what you end up with is a very thin layer of graphite flakes like this. If now what you do is you take another piece of scotch tape and stick them together, sticky side to sticky side. And let's see if I can do this without imitating Milton from the office here. Like this. And then simply peel them apart like this. You end up with very thin layers of graphite. And if you do this three or four times, you end up with a single atomic layer of graphene. It really works. You can now take this into your laboratory, put it into your electron microscope, and you can study it. The problem is, if you want to build a bridge, there isn't enough scotch tape in the world to produce the amount of graphene you need. Yet this method is scalable. This is called electrochemical exfoliation, and it became popular about 10 years ago, and you can see why. What you need is a source of some graphite, and in our case today, we're using these thin, flexible sheets that you can buy in large rolls at low cost, and it's typically sold to make gaskets and liners for high-temperature furnaces. You cut a couple of strips from the graphite, place it inside of a container, and hook it up to a power supply. Then you add an electrolyte solution, typically ammonium sulfate, 0.2 to 0.4 molar, or 25 to 50 grams in a liter of pure water. Add the electrolyte to the container, and then turn on the power. Now immediately, you start to see these bubbles forming. What we're doing is we're electrolyzing the water and we're forming a hydrogen and oxygen gas. But in the process, we're making hydronium and hydroxide ions in the solution. The negatively charged hydroxide ions are attracted over to the positive anode. And what they do is they sort of get into that anode. They're driven into the anode by the attraction and begin to try to separate apart those individual sheets of graphene. They're followed by the even larger sulfate ions, which wedge their way further between. And because both of these ions are larger in diameter than the normal spacing between the sheets, they exfoliate it, they delaminate it, they separate it away. Now, obviously, this is very attractive because the equipment needed is super simple, and the scalability of this is tremendous. You could bring this up to swimming pool size. The problem is, it doesn't work very well. The reason is that unlike with the tape, where we're pulling away one sheet at a time, this process of exfoliation is working on all the millions of layers of graphene in the graphite and the anode simultaneously. So we might get lucky and separate layer one from layer two, but the next layer that comes free may be layer 300 from 301, 10,000 from 10,001. What you end up with in solution is a tiny bit of graphene and a large number of thin flakes of graphite. Furthermore, you contaminate the graphene with the oxygen, the hydrogen, and the sulfur in the electrolyte. So you have to do post-processing to clean it up. Now, there are ways to mitigate some of this pre-separation of the graphite, but they don't work particularly well. If they did, we would be seeing graphene on the market in ton quantities at low cost, and we don't. 
Both of these methods that I've just demonstrated are called top-down synthesis. You start with the graphite and you separate out the graphene. The other approach, I'm going to turn this off before I set up an explosive environment in here, is called bottom-up synthesis. You start with the carbon and you grow the graphene from scratch. And that too is done all the time. In large chemical vapor deposition machines with large vacuum chambers, they will remove the air and they will introduce a carbon donor, typically methane, and a buffer gas like helium or argon. Then they will create a plasma inside of the chamber, which rips apart the methane, freeing up the hydrogen and the carbon. And under an electromagnetic field, the carbon is drawn down to the bottom where it deposits, usually on a copper plate. This really works because the carbon to carbon bond in graphene is the most stable of all carbon bonds. It naturally grows graphene. Without any further guidance from us, it wants to make graphene, and it does. And what's funny is if you actually change the parameters in the chamber a little bit and replace the copper with a different roadmap, a different lattice to kind of guide the carbon's growth, you can actually induce it to form the second most stable form of carbon, diamond. Something for a future video. The problem with this, though, is we're forming graphene in picogram quantities, trillionths of a gram with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. Again, we're not going to build a bridge. Enter Rice University. A couple of years ago, a graduate student named Ui Long in the laboratory of Dr. James Tour developed a technique called flash graphene that uses substantially less expensive equipment and produces high quality graphene at orders of magnitude higher production rate than the CVD machine. And that is what we're going to show you how to do today. Now to start with, you need a glass tube, and in our case we're using quartz. And you need a carbon source, and in this case we're using carbon black, or soot. Now it's an interesting thing in the paper put out of rice. They indicated it really doesn't matter what you start with as the carbon source. You can use carbon black, but you can also use coal, ground up tires, <laughs> coffee grounds, beetles. The reason it doesn't matter is because we're going to heat this carbon to over 3100 Kelvin. And when, when we do, no matter what you started out with, all of the chemical bonds are going to break. Where the magic happens is in the cooling. Just like in the chemical vapor deposition machine, once the carbon is freed up and it begins to cool, it will naturally grow graphene all on its own. And if we cool it slowly, what will happen is the individual graphene sheets will begin to line up and stack, and we will build graphite. We don't want that. However, if you cool this in milliseconds, the individual sheets don't have time to do that annealing. They can end up freezing in a shifted mode or a twisted or even tipped form. They call this turbostratic graphene for some reason, or turbostratic graphite. And the main point, though, is that because the bonds between the material are so weak, once we end up getting the graphene out, we can easily exfoliate this. We can use something as simple as a mortar and pestle. We've done that. It works. Or you can use something like a sonicator. About 100 watts, 20-30 minutes, and you break up all the individual sheets of graphene. So let me show you how we prepare this tube. Okay, in the paper they recommend using quartz, which is a good choice. It's got a high temperature tolerance and it's very tough. They also recommend using a thin wall quartz tube to speed the cooling and improve the graphene production. That doesn't make sense because all of the cooling is going to be radiative, black body radiation cooling. It's not conduction, so it doesn't matter how thick the tube is because it's completely transparent to all of the waves of light that the hot carbon will make. And a heavier wall tube is just a little more robust, less likely to break. What we are using is a 7mm ID, 11mm OD, 
two millimeter wall thickness, medium to heavy wall quartz tube. We want to cut off 100 millimeters or four inches. Now, if you had a diamond saw, you could just cut across here. But a real easy technique is simply to fracture it. So what I'm going to do is create a little stress point that will allow it to fracture in a controlled way. Now, they make diamond scribes for this, but you really don't need to do that. You can use a triangular machinist file. It works just fine. So at the mark that I've already made at 100 millimeters, I'm going to take this little scribe and I'm going to draw it across and scratch it. Now, if you glass blowers out there, I know, just a little nick. But the point is, with this heavy wall and tough quartz, I find that I have to make a pretty decent scratch to get a lot reliable break. So I'm going to give this a couple of good scores to ensure the break. Then there is a little trick I learned many years ago from a glass blower, and don't know why it works, but it really does. You need to wet the scratch. Some of them will actually take the tube and they'll lick it. But, you know, glass dust. So what I'm going to do is just take a Q-tip with a little water on it and wet it like that. Then, if you take this and put your thumbs on either side of the scratch like this, opposite the scratch so it's away from you, then aim it down at the floor just in case things go kind of sideways and give it a little snap, just like that. And you end up with a very nice crack. And even if it's a little rough, doesn't really matter. We're only using the middle section. Now, we have to prepare the electrodes. What they recommend using is a fine mesh copper wool. You can get this on Amazon, and it's a good choice because copper has a very high thermal and electrical conduction. It's also very malleable, so you can form a very nice, conformable, compressible electrode to carry the electricity that we're going to send into the carbon. To prepare this, what you do is you measure off about a half a gram of this wool, and you can just sort of pull it off like this. this I know this is a little much from experience. And we'll weigh this, see how close I guessed. Oh, 70. Let's take off a little bit. And this doesn't have to be precise. You could use a gram. The only reason I'm trying to be a little close is because I want to use the minimal amount so that I don't use up all the internal volume of the tube and don't have any room for the carbon. Now, the next trick is you put it in your hand, and for all of those little threads, you want to gather them together. So you just roll it up like a spicy meatball, like that. Nice. And then a little sushi action here into a little cylinder, like that. And then we're going to insert this into the end of the tube. Sometimes a little twisting action will help, but usually if you've rolled it well enough, this will go in pretty easily. Once you get it in the end of the tube, like that, then you want to conform this. You want to compress this into a little pellet. What I have to do that with is these tungsten welding rods. These are quarter inch, so 6.4 millimeters, 7 millimeter tube, nice fit. I place this in this end here like this, and then I take another tungsten welding rod in the other end like this, and then I put it down and I hammer it with a board like this to form a nice compressed cylinder. Then I'm going to push this a little further down like this to give me the maximum amount of room for the carbon because it's very bulky. Now, before we weigh out the carbon, I'm going to do one more electrode and preform it because I'm not going to be able to take advantage, I think it's always turning off, of the hammering when I've got the soft carbon in there. So we'll weigh that. <laughs> 55, good enough, or 550 milligrams. So now again, another little roll. A little sticky rice action. And then we're going to insert this in the end of a, just an off cut, short piece of tubing that I've got for this purpose, and push it in the end of the tube. Now, this time when I compress this, I'm not going to compress it as vigorously as I did the last time. I just want to form this so that I'll have a better shape when I put it in the other end of the tube. 
And then we'll just extrude that out like that. Now we're going to add the carbon black. Now we're going to zero this down. And what we're going to want to do is add 150 milligrams, 0.15 grams of carbon black. Okay, now carbon black can be a little nasty. It is like moon dust. It gets everywhere. So you want to use the plastic. You want to use gloves. And I'm using these gloves here just for this purpose because they have a longer cuff. And in addition, you want to use a mask. And probably this is not the right shirt for this purpose, but I've done this enough. I think I'll, I'll, think I'll get away with it. Well, we'll find out. So let's get this guy on. Okay. Oh, I hate these things. All right, now. The way to fill the tube Get this right. Okay. That's zeroed. Is to take a little craft stick. You can get these at uh, Walmart. And you're going to scoop in there and carry up kind of a lump of carbon. And then you're just going to sort of scrape it into the tube like this. This takes a long time and we nearly have to fill the tube to get to the 150 milligrams that we're going to need. This stuff is very bulky. Let's see how close we got. Halfway. <laughs> Point 0.15. I did it. I really did it. That was fast. That was faster than most of them. Now just wipe this off. Take the preformed electrode that we've already made. Push this in the end of the tube like this, like that. And then with the tungsten rod, I'm just going to push this in a little bit to seat it. I don't want to compress it, not here. Let's go put this in the reactor. Uh, enough with this. All right, this is the reactor. And the way this works is there's a fiberglass base that supports two conductive posts that I've drilled holes in that allow the tungsten welding rods to slide in and out from each end. And then they can be locked by a couple of set screws here into position. Now, the way we set this up is I have an ohm meter hooked onto the back of here, and I'm gonna take the cylinder like this I'm going to place it in position on the end of this rod, push it all the way in like this, and then with the set screw, lock this into position so it doesn't move anymore. Then this is hooked up to an ohm meter back here, and when I slide the other rod in here, you'll start to see that the ohms slowly lower as I begin to manually compress the carbon between them. See it going down? Now I'm going to bring this down to about three and a half ohms because we're compressing the carbon particles closer to each other. Now you could use this if you ever wanted to make custom resistors. It's kind of a neat technique. But one thing to keep in mind is you can only go one way. Once we've compressed this, if you overshoot, you can't back out. It won't spring back. And the goal here is to get to about three and a half ohms. Like this. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to attach this little jig 
on the back of this. And then using the wrench and this screw, I'm going to drive it in more precisely. What we want to reach is 2.0 ohms. And in all of the numbers I'm giving you for all of these parameters, the voltages, the quantities, and the resistance, you want to be within about 10%. If you stay between, say, 1.8 and 2.2 ohms, things are going to work. But once you get outside of those numbers, it begins to get kind of funky and you don't get very good productivity. And approach this kind of slowly because if you overshoot, like I said, you're kind of stuck. Okay, good. Now, using the wrench and these set screws over here, I'm going to lock this into place and then I'm going to remove the jig on the end. Don't need this anymore. Put this over here. Now we don't need this anymore, so I'm going to disconnect it. Now, originally, when I did this, I had built a little acrylic barrier like this to go around the outside for the test for two reasons. One, if, if this ever did explode, what happens is the debris would be directed outward and not toward us. It makes it a little safer. And I normally give people the warning that, you know, be careful if you do this stuff at home because this stuff can be dangerous. This voltage and current that we are using here is absolutely lethal. The kinds of volts and amps that we're using in this system is very similar to the parameters used in a cardiac defibrillator, except we're going to be using three times as much power as the highest setting in any cardiac defibrillator. This will kill you. So you've got to be very, very careful. Now, when we fired this, I did this a couple dozen times. I was not getting a very good result. What was happening is I was getting very little graphene production and I was making a mess. The carbon was all over the table. It was on the inside of this guide. Couldn't figure it out. And then I saw a short video clip that was put out by the group from Rice to demonstrate this. And I saw that they were doing this in a vacuum chamber. Now, they didn't put that in the article. <laughs> but the point is, it makes sense. Because even though we've compressed this carbon, it's still about 90% air inside of there. And when we heat this up from 300 Kelvin room temperature to about 3500 Kelvin, the pressure of the air inside there goes to 12 atmospheres. It blows the carbon out through the electrodes all over the table and doesn't leave anything left to react. So we're going to do the reaction inside of a vacuum chamber. So I'll put this in here, just get it set up for you. I'm going to slide this in here like this. And we'll connect up the electrodes, the feed through, like this. And now I'm going to explain the power system. What we have here is a variable AC transformer, a variac. This sends power through to a MOT or microwave oven transformer that steps up the voltage. We then send this through two rectifiers. So it's a half wave rectification that sends pulses of DC current into this capacitor bank. Each of these electrolytic capacitors are rated at 250 volts and they are 27 millifarads or 27,000 microfarads. The three that you see in front are wired up in parallel. So you add the capacitance, 81 millifarads. The two rows are in series. So you cut the capacitance in half. So the system capacitance is 40 millifarads. Behind here, I have a little dump resistor that just drains residual current at the end to make things safe. Over here is the switch. This is an SCR, which stands for Silicon Controlled Rectifier. It's an extremely high voltage, high current, high speed, solid state switch. And the way that it works is that little red lead that you see coming out of the center of there is the trigger. When you apply a three volt positive potential to that versus the ground, 
it will close the switch and send about a thousand amps through the carbon, heating it up. The way I provide that is I take these two batteries, wire them down to, from ground to three volts and send that into the trigger. So when I push this button, this will close and will heat up and make the graphene. Now, in order to get the vacuum chamber up here, I'm going to make a little bit of noise and we're going to start draining this down. What holds the lid on is, grab, is uh, air pressure. So I have to center this by hand before we hit the vacuum valve. And then we'll start draining the vacuum. One, two, three. And immediately you'll see the vacuum beginning to form. This will take about two minutes or so to happen. You also want to go down to about one hundredth of an atmosphere. You can go lower, but the problem is once you go much below that, you lose the insulating properties of the air and you can get flashover or arcing between the condu conduits. So 1% or 7,600 microns or 7.6 millimeters, that's the goal. Turn on my little vacuum gauge. And we'll just give this a little time to work. All right, so we're down to about 6,700 microns of mercury. It's a little low, but it leaks slowly, so we'll let that go. That's a relief. Now, what we're going to want to do is put approximately 7,200 joules per gram of carbon in order to heat it properly. For the 150 milligrams we're using, that works out to about 1,100 joules or watt seconds. For 40 millifarads, that works out to about 237 volts on the voltmeter when we fire this. Now, the other thing I've got over here is a photodiode hooked up to an oscilloscope in trigger mode. So when we make the bright flash, we can, like this, see a pulse that will give us how long it took to heat and how long it took to cool. If you're doing this using the numbers that I give you, you don't need this equipment. This was necessary to kind of fine tune the numbers. So that can save you a little bit of effort. Now the voltage here, just a little trick. Whenever you're dealing with a high voltage source, it's always a good idea to unplug it when you're working with it, just in case. And a double safe thing is to unplug it and put the plug or the cord where you're going to trip on it. So that if you get tired and you get a little sloppy, you don't make a mistake and you say, oh, I think I unplugged it. There's no way to miss this. So we're going to go ahead plug this in and start charging this guy up. Now, if you watch the volt meter over here, I'm going to begin charging this and we're going to be looking for 237 volts. See it going up 21, 30. I'm actually going to overshoot this slightly and then maybe 241, 242. And then when I turn this off, what we'll do is allow the, the resistor in the back to bleed it down at about a volt a second. As soon as we hit 237, I'm going to fire it and we'll take a look and see what we made. And be very careful when you're dealing with voltage and current like this. This is very, very dangerous. Our pressure is about 7,100 microns right now, so that's good. I'm getting close. 220, 230. Okay, now watch it decay. 241, 240, 39, 38, 37. And that's it. We just made graphene. And you can see the spike over here. We heated this up in a very small fraction of time. Each of those divisions is 20 milliseconds. So it took about five milliseconds to heat and it took about 25 milliseconds for it to cool. That's perfect. The other thing you'll notice is there's still a little bit of residual voltage there. And so before I touch anything metal, I'm going to go ahead and give this a little bit of time to decay down to a safe voltage and unplug it as well to make things super duper safe. Then we'll take this out and we'll see what we made. All right, you can see that our voltage is down to about 3.4 volts. 
I'm unplugged, everything should be safe. Let's break the vacuum. So we'll enter air. Now you see you do get a little bit of debris, a little bit of the carbon black, but a milligram of carbon black goes a very long way. So most of the material stayed inside the chamber or inside the reaction tube. Let's get this out and I'll show you what it looks like. Slide this out. And I'm going to loosen this up a little bit. And pull these back just a touch. And if you look at the tube, you see that gray, shiny layer inside there in the middle? That's graphene. So I'm going to take this out of the reactor and we're going to take a look at what we made. Get this stuff out of here. All right. All right, let's see what we've got in the reaction tube here. There. Okay. Now you're going to have to zoom in on this. Look very closely. But inside of here, what you'll see is these gray flakes like this. These are the graphene. Some of them are a little smaller. This is a particularly large one. And you can see that in this particular one, I'll move this over here. This is an example of about five or six of these batches. You can see the gray flakes over here as well. Now, the black could be some residual uh, carbon black if this isn't 100% conversion. In addition, some of the black might be graphite and even what they call wrinkled graphene, very, very small pieces of graphene that are sort of tied up in little knots like tissue paper. They're not particularly useful. The reason it's gray, it's my understanding, is that the turbostratic material, because of the very loose interfaces between the different layers of graphene, they work like interference filters, almost like a diamond. And that's why they appear to be gray. And in addition to that, uh, when you grind them up and you actually separate it out, they become black. So problem now is to get rid of some of this additional material. You want to try to filter this out. And a little trick is to take a screen. This is a little $5 fine mesh screen from Walmart. And take out the electrodes. We don't need those. And just put this through here like this and shake it around. The graphene tends to form larger flakes. And so generally speaking, you'll lose only a tiny bit of it through the holes, but you'll keep most of the larger flakes and the stuff that you really want. You can then take this and to further separate it, just put it into a beaker of water, swirl it around for a minute, let the heavier, larger pieces of graphene settle to the bottom, bottom and the lighter tiny pieces or the more buoyant pieces uh, will float or stay in the water and then you just pour that off. You don't need any filter paper. Just do what you do if you were gold panning and you end up with these nice gray flakes at the end. Now, if you're still, if you're still watching, one question you might ask is how do I know that this is graphene? And it's a good question. If we had an electron microscope or an atomic force microscope, we could actually study this and look at the morphology. But the workhorse for evaluating graphene is called Raman spectroscopy. Kind of an interesting process. If you take a laser and you shine it at a surface, 99 plus percent of the light will be either scattered and reflected or absorbed by the material. But a very small fraction of the light will interact with the molecular bonds on the surface. In some cases, it will donate energy to those bonds and those photons will be redshifted, reddened. And in some cases, it picks up energy from those bonds and it will be blue shifted.
The degree of shift is exquisitely sensitive to the nature of those bonds and their environment. So for example, you can easily detect the OH bond in water, and it's completely different from the OH bond, same bond when it's in methanol or ethanol. You can also identify the carbon to carbon bond in graphene. And you can even distinguish the carbon to carbon bond in the inside of the sheet from the ragged edges of the sheet. Furthermore, if you have a couple of sheets of graphene together, graphite, that produces a different peak and you can identify it. Now, despite all the stuff that we have in this laboratory, we don't have Raman spectroscopy. I think I can call in a favor and get this analyzed. But if we step back for just a second, the reason I'm making this graphene is as a structural reinforcement. So if I test this and it performs like graphene, I don't care if I made marzipan. So let me show you how we tested it. All right, what I did is I took some of these methyl cellulose shipping rods. These are very thin plastic tubes. You can get them with caps. And when you put the cap on the bottom, you can fill it. And that's what I did. I made up some mixtures of epoxy. In one of the tubes, I just placed pure epoxy. In this tube, I put in epoxy and 0.3%, one part in 300, of the carbon black, the precursor. In this tube, I put in 0.3% of graphite. I simply took a razor blade and scraped it off the side of that rod that I showed you earlier in the video. In this rod, 0.3% of the graphene. And in this one, 0.6% of the graphene. So let's go bend to some beams. Alright, so what we did in the hydraulic jack here is I set up this test jig. It consists of a load cell on this side, which reads up over here, a support block on the other side, and then a central block that is six millimeters shorter than these two. So when we bend the beam six millimeters, this aluminum tape will contact there, and the volt ohm meter at the top will give you a beep. So when we hear the beep, we'll notice how much force was necessary to bend each bar six millimeters. Let's get started. This is the pure epoxy, obviously. Make sure everything is centered. Zero kilograms. Let's go. Sixty-four point eight six, one point oh six, one point two six, one point four two, one point five, one point six, one point six, call it one point seven, one point six eight. Now, to be fair, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the beam one hundred and eighty degrees like this, just in case there's some natural bend in the beam. And we'll take the average of the two numbers and do it again. One point two, point three, point four, about point five. So we'll call it maybe 1.6 as an average. There might have been a little bit of residual bow there. Now we'll test the carbon black or the precursor. Same technique. We're zeroed. We're centered. Let's go. Three point six one point six, one point five eight, and again, we'll rotate it and take the average.
they're probably pretty straight. We're getting pretty similar numbers each time. And make sure this is super tight so it doesn't leak while we're measuring. Okay, zero, zero. Point six four, So pretty much the same thing. The carbon black didn't weaken it or strengthen it appreciably. It's kind of in the noise. So now let's test the graphite. This is 0.3% by weight. All of these are by weight of graphite. There we go. Zero it. Okay. You'll see a little variation in the weight simply by filling up the rod. But if we start at zero, it's really a bending modulus that we're measuring. It's a little stiffer. 2.46, something like that. So the graphite did stiffen it a little bit. Let's see, I didn't raise that quite enough. Okay, here we go. Okay, 1.54, pretty much the same. They're pretty straight. So we gained about 50% bending modulus stiffness from adding the graphite, 0.3%. Maybe there's a little graphene in there. Let me show you what happens when we use 0.3%, same mass loading of graphene. Center it. All right. Let's see what we get. It's definitely stiffer than the epoxy, and it's stiffer than the graphene, the graphite. <laughs> <clears throat> five, five point five, five point seven kilograms. <laughs> Let's just do the other side, just in case it's bowed and we're fooling ourselves here. And do it again. Okay, 3.2, 4, 4.8, 5.5, <laughs> all six. So we've gained about 400% in stiffness by adding 0.3%, one part in 300 of graphene. Now let's see what happens with 0.6% graphene. Right. 
Zeroed? Yep. All right, here we go. Seven, eight, ten point two. We gotta be fair. I have to say that that is pretty legit. <laughs> this this graphene is freaking amazing. Okay, let's go. Eight, nine. 10, 11. <laughs> okay, so by adding one part in 160, we increased the bending modulus of the epoxy 750%. That's amazing. This stuff really does work. It's pretty good marzipan. Now, What's interesting about this is the 0.3% rod that I manufactured did take two batches of that graphene in order to make the mixture. And for this rod, I had to do four batches in order to have enough. And that took a little bit of time. But with graphene prices being $500 plus per gram, it's time well spent. And furthermore, you can scale this up. The most expensive part of this whole reaction was the capacitors and the SCR switch, and I'm only using them at about 20 to 25% of their maximum capacity. You could quadruple the batch without buying anything else. Now, if you did that, don't do the most convenient thing, which is to increase the diameter of the tube. If you double the diameter, you'll quadruple the batch. The problem is, You'll quadruple the volume, but you'll only double the surface area, which will slow the cooling and you'll get mostly graphite. But if you lengthen the rods, both the area and the volume go up the same. So if you went to a four time dose, four times what we just did here, you would go from two ohms to eight ohms on your resistance because you want the same compaction. And if you want the same pulse duration, you have to lower the capacitance four times. And if you want to put four times the amount of energy into one fourth of the capacitance, you have to quadruple the voltage, C V squared. But you don't have to buy anything different. You just rewire the capacitors for a different series and parallel setup, and you're good to go. This is useful. An amateur could use this to build super epoxies, and because the epoxy percentage is so, or the additive percentage is so low, it doesn't change the rheology of the epoxy. It mixes, pours, spreads, and flows just like the pure stuff. So you could add this to composite laminates that you're manufacturing and take advantage of the super high modulus of the, of the epoxy. Now you could do this at home as an amateur, you could do this as a small industrial setup, but if you were gonna be trying to produce graphene, in the kilogram or ton volume or weight, this is still a batch process and that does have some downsides. What's interesting is that it was a recent paper published by a man named Abinul Islam from the Indian Institute of Technology, Patna. I'll put a link to both that paper that he wrote as well as the Rice Group paper in the description below the video. The point is he came up with a method that produces very high quality graphene at orders of magnitude higher production rates than this. And it's a continuous process that's scalable. Now like the ramen, the equipment that they used is beyond us, but just a little bit. So stay tuned because we ain't done yet. And if you like the kind of stuff that we're doing on this channel and the stuff that we're gonna be doing, please do me a huge favor and consider subscribing. It really helps us out. And a couple of years ago, I never thought I would say this, but I actually do believe now we're going to surpass a million subscribers and we may actually do that this year.
That would be absolutely fantastic and I'd appreciate it. But it's also important because it drives the YouTube algorithms to distribute our videos to a broader audience. And the more views, the larger we get, the more we can afford to do. These projects take a lot of time and a fair amount of money to develop. So I'd really appreciate it if you take a few seconds and subscribe. In any case, I want to thank you very much for watching. Stay safe, have fun, and I'll see you soon.